All right. So here, I'll selfie it for at the start. So here's what we have to do. The point of the key passages isn't just to give you another assignment. The point of the, the, point of the key passages is to start figuring out as an attentive reader how to find things that carry significant meaning in the text and how to explain them in a way that matters. All right? The best way to understand literature is to be hyper aware as you read it, to have your antennae out, so to speak. And every time something kind of, I don't know, makes your eyebrows go up, it's a moment to pause and reflect on it. You don't have to spend a lot of time in reflection in that moment, but you need to maybe underline it, put a post-it note on it. I have extra post-it notes if you need them. So you can go back and look at that thing and its significance. The going back and looking at it and its significance, that's the key passage. And when we're done writing one together, we'll talk about how to make it really good and really helpful for you. So let's together, I am going to type right here, and we are going to write one together. So here's what we need to do first. Let's find a moment in chapter three that we feel is particularly interesting and worthwhile, okay? okay. I am open to suggestions. Page okay, we have different page numbers, so you got to give me the beginning of the paragraph. Uh, Why does that seem like a thing worth analysis to you? Okay, so the last the two last sentences when food came in, the humans were being quiet and trusting and beautiful. They should quiet, trusting and beautiful. For me Um, okay. So the moment when the on the box car, the prisoners of war are collecting their excrement and they're passing it around so they can dump it out and they're being decent to one another. It is important and it does illustrate that they are kind to each other, but I don't know it's something that will re that will reward us with deep analysis. Yeah, I think it's very much on the surface. It, it has said what it's trying to but say. The use of the word human beings, human beings, you always prefer them to like. He, well, okay, so maybe, so here's, okay, so let, let's try this. If I go with, so in these things, here's how I want you to organize anything that you write for key passage. First, I want you to set down the context for where it is in the book, all right? Set it up a little bit. Then I want you to put down the passage, slash quote, slash, quote, slash, moment itself, right? Then I want you to provide me with some analysis of it. With this one, if we were talk about that moment and his use of the word human, we can maybe say something about um, on the box car as the uh, prisoners are huddled together in dire circumstances, Vonnegut describes their behavior, behavior, in sharing and working together as, give me the quote, say it loudly though, and slowly. When food came in, the human beings were quiet, and trusting and beautiful, they shared. Quiet and trusting and beautiful, they shared. That's what there's a comma right after it Okay. Now, here's the issue I'm going to have. I don't know how much analysis I have to offer about this moment. So I can say maybe something about, come on, computer. My keyboard's dying. Oh, there we go. Okay. So, come on. Hmm. This is going to dramatically hurt things. Okay, well, while it figures out its business, I can identify here that he's using, that he frequently uses the word human and that there's a motif here. A motif being a thing that pops up over and over again that carries significant meaning but isn't exactly symbolic, it's something that we're supposed to notice over and over where it's cueing us to some kind of meaning. I actually think later on in that passage would be a more interesting thing when he talks about that they form a single organism that excretes as one. I think that's more interesting because it's his dehumanizing moment and talking about how they become kind of animalistic. Um, 
but maybe something about Vonnegut often uses the word human when come on when describing his oh come on his characters this stands out for a few boy this thing sounds upset for a few reasons first it is odd to distinguish this because characters are pretty much in novels, right? Maybe something like that. So we're saying it stands out because it's weird he's distinguishing them. That could be partly because this is largely a science fiction novel and there's a lot of aliens in it. So maybe something like that. However, come on computer, this is stressful. Sorry. Let's see if this thing's gonna work. All right, uh, something along the lines of, however, Vonnegut also uses it in an adjectival sense. To describe the decency inherent in their actions. Catch up. Just for the record, I'm a faster typist than a computer can handle. I'm just saying, that's very impressive. Um, maybe something like that. I type with, when I type, I want the keyboard to know I have typed. My goal is to break every keyboard I touch. I want to have full intensity. You type on a very little. No. Wait, go typing. He's like barely. Okay. Um, so maybe there's something there uh, that he's using it as an adjective so frequently to talk about their decency. Particularly after he's gotten the notion of, yeah, okay, we, we can sculpt this into something. Particularly after, in chapter 3, he talks about two perfect human beings in the form of Adam and Eve that are seen in the, in the boots, right? Mm -hmm. That could work. I can see something with that. That works for me. So I think we could make this into something pretty good. Describe the decency. There we go. Let's fix all this. Decency. Does he that he always called the Americans? The Americans. The Americans. The Americans. Okay, so, yeah, so that, that would do it. Then, however, Vonnegut also uses it in an adjectival sense to describe the decency inherent in their actions, so that works. Um, this echoes earlier in, in the chapter when Billy has his vision of Adam and Eve, whom the narrator describes as perfect humans. Uh, yeah, that works for me. I think that's actually a pretty decent key passage now. Um, we'll come back to what I would do with this. Let's look at the one that I did as a demo yesterday with students. Yesterday we looked at, oh, where is it? Come here. Come back. There we go. Yesterday we looked at this one. So we've got our context, our key moment, or our key passage, our quote, and the analysis, right? It's the same thing. Now you may have noticed, this is very much like every body paragraph you've ever written in your life for a paper, right? It's essentially point evidence analysis, same thing you do in history classes or anything else. This is the basis of a paragraph in a literary paper. So the difference being, in literary analysis, usually you're making one overall point throughout the whole paper, and you establish that in your theme statement or your thesis statement, and then all your body paragraphs are backing up the same point over and over. Now it can change a bit, you can elaborate more deeply on things, but essentially it's all the same. Now in chapter three, we talked about when Billy's getting undressed and he's taking off his glasses and his jacket and everything else, right? So it says here, in chapter three, Billy is undressing in his empty house as his wife and daughter prepare for his daughter's wedding. We as readers know that Billy will be abducted by the aliens after that wedding. Interestingly, Billy wears a very specific type of glasses. This really struck me when I was reading. If you wear glasses, they tend to be monofocal, right? They have a single focus point, a focal point. If you're nearsighted, they help you see things far away, right? 
Your far side of the hill, you see things that are close up. If you have bifocals, what do they do? They help you see both. There's the bottom of the lens has one focal point and the top has another. So when you're looking at the distance, you can see things far away. When you look down while you're reading, you can read something close to you. Trifocals are incredibly rare. Not a lot of people wear trifocals. That is extraordinarily bad vision. Your far vision, your medium vision, your close vision all need correction, right? Okay. In what way do human beings see? How many dimensions? Three. Three. That's interesting. Do we not? He wear no, he, we do. But Billy wears trifocals and we see in three dimensions. He's about to, we know, he's about to be abducted by the aliens. How do they see? In four dimensions. That's very interesting. Seeming to imply that as earlier in the chapter, he uses the mechanical owl to fix how people see the world. The aliens are about to fix how he sees the world as well, right? So, Billy took off his trifocals. It's a very uncommon thing to wear trifocals, and we cannot help but anticipate that this is a significant image due to the motifs of glasses, lenses, and vision. Billy, as regular human, sees his life and all of existence in three dimensions, which is echoed by his wearing trifocals. This is ironic, given that after his daughter's wedding, he will see things in four dimensions like the Trophimidorians do. That's not bad, right? That's pretty good. Now, here's what's interesting to me. If we have, we'll have this as a discussion with all of us here. There we go. So, if we have, how can I put this? If over the course of the book, you're going to write 12 different uh, key passages, right? 12 of these things. If you have 12 of these at the end of it, and you look at all of them, you may notice, because you're the person you are, you're going to be attuned to different things. Maybe you're more keen to talk about aliens. Maybe you're keen to talk about the vision and uh, that motif. Maybe you're going to talk about the different symbols of rivers and time. Maybe you're going to look at whatever it is, the war parts, right? If you write 12 of these and six of them are about the war, that's interesting. You take those seven aside, look at what they have in common, what they're getting at, could you write a single thesis statement that uses all of those? Sure. Put them in chronological order, write an introduction, write a conclusion, and your essay's done. These are pre-made body paragraphs for an essay. They are, in fact, your final essay in rough draft form. If you keep up on all these and you do a good job on them, all you have to do is write two paragraphs and your whole essay's finished. Then you'll have to tweak a little for transitions, things like that, but essentially, you're finished. You have 12 quotes ready to go for your paper. Would this be a helpful thing in college? Yes. Absolutely. As you read, keep note of things that are interesting. Write up why it's interesting. Put it away. It's a paragraph. It won't take you any time at all. Do that for every chapter in college. Your essays are finished. If you do this as you read anything for the AP exam or whatever else, this is interesting. This is interesting. Why are they interesting? Put them in order. Craft a thesis statement that will suit what you just collected, and you're done writing your paper. You're welcome. I just made college really easy, by the way. You're welcome. Don't give me your sarcastic applause. All right. So, what? Any questions about this, and why it's helpful? Do you agree it's helpful? Yeah. Is it going to be easier to write key passages now? Yeah. Do you understand what I want from them? Yeah. Okay. So here's what we need to do next. We need to start reading chapter four. Ooh, why are we groaning about this? I, what? I really to read why are you just waving hello at me? What? Valerie, what? You were, okay, fine. So, um, let's go ahead and...